up your Bibles, please. Let's make this confession together. I thank you, Father, thank you, Father that your word, your word has the power, has the power to, change to change my life. Today, I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And I'll never be the same after today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. How many of you have ever run out of gasoline? Raise your hand if you've ever run out of gasoline, ever. Keep your hand up. Way up. Come on. Some of you are going... I don't want anybody to know. Look, you're good. How many of you ran out of gasoline and you didn't know you were running out of gasoline until the car stopped? Raise your hand. How many of you never look at your gasoline gauge and you never hear the little ding, ding, ding that tells you you're running out of gasoline? Maybe this was before they had the, I remember when you ran out of gas and there weren't any bells or whistles. It was just a gauge. It went down. If you didn't watch it, you would just run out. For me, there's not a more terrifying feeling than knowing you're running out of gasoline and no place to get any. I, uh, it just feels, has that, that ever happened to anybody? You, you know, I, I remember one time, and I'm, I'm pretty good about putting gasoline in the car. I don't, I don't, when it gets close to empty, I put gasoline in the car. I don't like, I don't like getting riding down. Some of you, you like living dangerously. You're going to watch that thing go down and you're going to get down to E. Then you're going to get down to blinking E. Then you're going to get down to ding, 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 E. And it's just going to keep going down and down and down. And you just, you like playing with danger. I don't like that. I don't like that feeling. But I know one time, uh, this was years ago, our children were really small and I, I, I have no explanation. You're going you're gonna to look at me and say, so, Pastor, are you stupid? Uh, I, the, I have no explanation except to say, we got in the car to go on a trip with our children. It's Christmas Eve. It's freezing outside. We get our children. We bundle them all up in the car. We've got them all in, all bundled up. And we've got them in the car. And it's about nine o'clock at night and we're driving about an hour and a half to our parents house and we get on the road and we're part the way there and I look at the gasoline gauge and it's on empty and I have never run out of gasoline in this car before so I don't know how far we can go does E mean E how many of you know E in some cars E doesn't mean E you're gonna know a hundred another hundred miles then there are cars that when it says E you're empty. And you, so you don't really know. And so I didn't know. And I still, this has been, my goodness, this has been 25, 35, this has been a long time ago. It's been 35 years ago. I still remember the feeling in the pit of my stomach as we're driving. And, I, and this is Christmas Eve. Nobody's open. There, are, there is no sheets. It's open all the time, 24 hours a day, even on Christmas Day, there is no, and so I, you know, I'm driving, and I, uh, you know, if you, listen, if you don't have your prayer language, that's the way to get it. <laughs> I mean, I'm praying, I'm just, I'm pro God, please, in the name of Jesus, just help, you know, and lo and behold, there was a little mom and pop service station right off the highway, we were able to get gasoline and move on, and it was, it was really, it was really dumb on my part to risk that. I mean, can you imagine having three small children on the side of the road on Christmas Eve and it's freezing outside and running out of gasoline? That was really dumb on my part. And yet I remember the feeling in the pit of my stomach. I remember the, our, am I, and here's, here's the thing that's in your head. Am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? I hope I'm going to make it. Are we going to make it? Look who's depending on me. I hope I'm going to make it. And this is what an empty life feels like. This is what it feels like when we're running on empty. What if we don't make it? Are we going to make it? It's what, what it feels like in the pit of our stomach. Now, God has planned abundant life for you. 
And it's God's plan that you will make it. And when we're filled with God and we're filled with faith, we are going to make it. I want you to say, I'm going to make it. Say, we're going to make it. My family and I, we're going to make it to grandma's house. We're going to make it. This is God's plan. See, the will of God is not for you to go through life with this feeling in the pit of your stomach. I don't know if I'm going to make it. That's, that's what it feels like to have an empty life. Sometimes when we talk about having empty lives, people, people, um, people think of people who are not Christians who have not made a decision to follow Christ. And that's absolutely true. If you have not made a decision to follow Christ, you know very well what I'm talking about. And I've been there. I'm not condemning anybody. I've been there where I, I was empty, didn't have Christ in my life, and just, you know, just constantly feeling like, am I going to make it through life? What is life about? But then as we were before service, I was praying with my prayer partners and I was talking with them about, I always tell them, here's what I'm going to preach on. This is what the message is about. And they lay hands on me and pray for me. And as I did that, one of my prayer partners, actually Kent Lindsay said, you know, that's not, that doesn't only apply to people who aren't Christians. That applies to Christians too. There are plenty of Christians who are leading empty lives. And that's absolutely true. You know, you can stop at the service station and fill up your car. But you know, if you go and go and go and go and go and go and you don't fill it back up, you're going to run out. And so there are Christians here. When I'm talking about empty lives and filling ourselves back up, don't get smug and think, well, you know, he's talking to people who aren't Christians. I am talking to them and I'm also talking to you. That we all need to realize that God's will is an abundant life. John chapter 10, verse 10, that I had you turn to just now. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and they may have it abundantly. The word life is in the Bible I didn't count the times. But it's just when you look it up in the concordance, it just goes on and on and on. The word life. And the word life here is the Greek word zoe, Z-O-E. It's spelled Z-O-E, and it's pronounced zoe. And what zoe means is the life of God. It doesn't just mean that you're breathing. Is he alive? Well, he's breathing. But for a Christian, it's not enough to be breathing. The life of God... The Bible says that Jesus came that we might have abundant zoe, the life of God on the inside of us. Uh, John chapter 1 verse 4, it says in Christ's life, that life, that it, Christ is, let me start over, Christ is light and that light is the zoe life of men. John 4, 14, God will become a well in us that becomes a fountain of everlasting zoe, life. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of Zoe, life. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the Zoe, the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And then John 10, 10, what we just read, he has come to give Zoe life to us, abundant life. It is God's will, God's plan, God's purpose for, for us, for each one of us, that we experience the Zoe, life of God. Real life. That doesn't mean there aren't challenges. That means that we have excitement and anticipation and faith and purpose in spite of the challenges that we have in our lives. Everybody's going to go through challenges. It just depends on how we go through them. And are we going through them with life or defeat? Are we going through them with excitement or with dread? God's Zoe life is living in such a way that you're living out of his overflow in your life. And God's Zoe life affects our relationships, our families, our finances, even our businesses. God's Zoe life. I want to teach you some Greek today. Everybody say Zoe. Zoe. Zoe is life. God's life on the inside of us. And it's an abundant life. It's a life that will see you through any situation, any circumstance, any challenge. God is with us through the good times and the challenging times, but it's not just that God is with us, Emmanuel, but it's also Zoe that God is in us. 
and living through us. You see, an abundant life flows from inside of us. Many of us are paying attention to the outward trappings and the outward circumstances of life, trying to create some semblance of Zoe. This is why you've heard me talk so many times when I talk about faith. You can't have faith if you're going to base your life and your circumstances on what you see happening to you and you see happening on the outside of you because Zoe life is on the inside of you and we don't live our lives by the circumstances that are happening to us but but the life of God that's in us. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23 I want you to turn there, Proverbs 4.23. I was just going to read it, but I, you need to know, Proverbs 4.23, you need to know this scripture and you need to underline it, you need to circle it, you need to draw a box around it, Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Above everything, above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart because your heart is the wellspring of life. So when we're talking about an empty life as opposed to an abundant life, the big question for us as believers is are we protecting, are we guarding our heart? You see, the Bible doesn't tell us to create the reality of life in our hearts. An abundant life is not created out of of what we strive to do, but rather out of what God puts in us. And again, I I realize this is redundant. I just said this. But I, I really want you to get a hold of this idea that for so many of us, abundant life has to do with how we manage the circumstances of our lives. And don't get me wrong, the circumstances of our lives need to be managed, but they need to be managed from a position of strength that's on the inside of us because the life of God is in there. And we rely on the life of God. First of all, it says guard our heart, for out of it flow the issues of life, of Zoe. But before we talk about guarding our heart. Let's talk about how we receive this Zoe life. Where does Zoe life come from? We're not born with it. The Bible says that we were born in trespasses and sins. Zoe life was not born in us. But rather, when we turn our lives, when we yield our lives to Jesus Christ... And we say, yes, we were born into sin, the sin that Adam, uh, that Adam and Eve uh, participated in, in the Garden of Eden. That caused sin to pollute the whole human race. And so the Bible says that all of us are born in trespasses and sins. It's, and, you know, that's a hard concept for many of us to grasp. I know uh, at second service, our first great-grandchild... Nilea Sky Batista will be here, and we're going to bring her up on the platform and introduce her to everybody. And and uh, I, I realize you're not most of you are not going to be here second service, so just take my word for it. She's adorable. <laughs> and when you look at this child, it's it's really difficult for us to conceive that this child has sin born in its nature. We look at this baby and we think, how innocent. And yet all of us were born, Adam's sin polluted the whole human race. And it's important that we know that when we're looking in the mirror and we realize that we were born into sin because many of us want to protect our sin and say, well, I'm as good as the next person. That's not a real great claim to fame right there. Because the next person was also born into sin. All of us were. And then when we yield our lives to Christ and say, yes, I surrender my life to the one who gave me life. I yield my life to you. I believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ was crucified for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ raised from the dead to give me resurrection power. I believe it and I receive Jesus Christ into my life. And when we do that, a supernatural occurrence 
takes place even if we don't feel it. The Bible says that when we do that, then the Zoe life of God at that moment comes to live on the inside of us. And so Zoe life comes by believing. John 3, 36 says that if you believe in Jesus, you will have Zoe life. John 6, 40 says, guess what? If you believe in Jesus, you will have Zoe life. John 20, 31 says, guess what? If you believe in Jesus, you will have Zoe life. If you believe him, if you believe in him. Now, what is it that you need to believe? John 6, 63 says that the words, Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So the word, and whenever you see the word believe in the New Testament, one more Greek word. I know most of you don't care about this Greek stuff. But there's one more word that I want you to, to learn. And that is the Greek word for believe. It is pisteuo. Everybody say pisteuo. P-I-S-T-E-U-O. Pisteuo. And it means to trust, to cling to, or rely on. The Greek word for believe means to trust, to cling to, or rely on. Why is this important? Why do we care about this? Because many people think that to believe in Jesus is just simply to believe that he existed, that he lived, that he was a historical figure, or to even believe that he was a good person, or to even believe that the resurrection happened. But when we're talking about believing in Jesus, we're talking about trusting, clinging to him, and relying on him. John 3, 16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Most people in this congregation, not everybody, but most people have heard that passage of scripture before. And that believing does not mean, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was a historical figure. Well, I believe in Jesus. I even believe in the resurrection. It means that we trust him, that we cling to him for everything that we have, and we rely on him for our life. This is what it means to believe. And it's believing that gives us Zoe life. So that's how we get it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 is where we're going we're to start next week when we talk about empty promises. And we talk about the promises of God. Through Jesus, through the promises of God, God has given us everything that we need to experience Zoe life, the Bible says. So it's through these promises, through trusting God and his promises, clinging to God and his promises, relying on God and his promises, that's where Zoe life comes from. It's not something that we manufacture on the outside. It's something that we, tr we simply trust him and believe him. We trust him and believe him for our salvation. Remember I asked last week, what's your plan? God has a plan. God has a salvation plan. What's your plan? Is your plan God's plan or do you have your own plan? That was a little confrontational. But we thank God for the 35 people that made decisions to follow Christ last week. On Easter Sunday. Why? Because they, you, many of you are here who made those decisions. And you made those decisions because you realized that God has a plan. And your plan wasn't God's plan. I was in the same, I was in the same place. I had a plan. But it wasn't God's plan. And I had to change my plan for God's plan. I found out his plan was better. His plan works. My plan was not working. Today I want to talk with you about how to guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, for those of us that are believers, the Holy Spirit has come to live on the inside of us and that we are then to guard our heart because out of our heart springs a well of Zoe life. When we make a decision to follow Christ, as I described to you a moment ago, then the power of God, the life of God comes to live on the inside of us. And so then our responsibility comes not to create the power of God, not to create the life of God because the life of God is already in there. It's to protect what we have because uh, the parable of the sower tells us that as soon as the life of God comes in us, the enemy is there to take it. He wants to take it. He wants you to live to be a defeated Christian. He wants you to live. He wants you to go. He wants you to make it to heaven just barely by the skin of your teeth. And he wants you to have a miserable ride along the way. But John 10.10 10 says Christ came that we might have what? A, come on. Abundant life. Abundant Zoe life. And the enemy does not want you to experience that. He wants you to be broke 
and sick and depressed. But Jesus Christ came that you might have abundant life. I know, I know that many of us are going through, through challenges, through difficulties, through frustrating circumstances. And did you know that you can have life abundantly even in the midst of that? It's, it, uh, listen, our peace and our joy and our abundant life does not, is not determined by our outward circumstances. Everybody goes through junk. It's determined by what's on the inside of us. And we need to be determined we're going to live in victory because God's Zoe life lives on the inside of us. Let's talk about how to guard our heart. Everybody put your hand on your heart. Everybody say, God's life, his Zoe life lives on the inside of me. And I'm going to protect it. It's in there. I'm not trying to create it, but I need to protect it. That's what Proverbs says right here. It says, guard your heart, Proverbs 4.23. Guard your heart. The wellspring of the life of God lives in there. So guard it. It's already in there. So I'm not giving you four points on how to create the life of God in you. That, only, that comes by, believe, by trusting Christ. But once it's there, how do we guard it? Let me give you some ways to guard it. You interested in this? Yes. Let me give you some ways to guard it. Number one. Guarding your heart will cost you something. How many of you have ever put gasoline in your car and it didn't cost anything? I don't mean somebody bought it for you. I mean you pulled up to the tank and the cost on the tank was zero, zero, zero. Filling up the tank on your car costs you something. It's going to cost you something to fill up the tank on your car. Many people, when they buy cars, they don't realize, you know, they, they've barely got enough money to make the car payment, and they don't realize you've got to put gasoline in that thing. Filling up, leave, living a life that's full of the life of God will cost you something, and it has to be done regularly. I don't understand how I ran out of gas. I put gas in this car. Honey, what was it? Six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, I put gas in this car. I can't believe we ran out of gas. It has to be, I don't know about you, but I put gasoline in my car weekly. Don't wait until you're dangerously low before you fill up. Just like your car has to be managed, your heart has to be managed. And that's really the explanation. I know some of you have read this scripture, and it's really kind of freaked you out. In Matthew chapter 18... Verses 8 through 9, Jesus said, if your eye leads you astray, pluck it out so that you can experience Zoe life. That's a little creepy, isn't it? That scripture is not to be taken literally. That's not exactly what God wants us to do, what Jesus is telling us to do. He's simply saying this figuratively. Figuratively, he's saying, manage your life. If you want to experience his Zoe life, you need to manage your life. Not, well, now I've got the Holy Spirit on the inside of me and uh, I'm going to live life happily ever after. No, you've got to manage your life and you've got to protect that. Don't just sit and watch the needle on the gauge of your life go down to empty. But realize that you're going to have to manage. You're going to have to manage your life. And you're going to have to protect the life of God. Next, be careful what you hear. Amen. Mark chapter 4, verse 24. Careful what you hear. Realize that the enemy has, has certain things that he has introduced that he, wants to, uh, that he wants to get in there and mess with the life of God on the inside of you. He wants that to seep away. Be careful what you hear. Uh, don't listen to gossip. Don't listen to gossip about people. That's kind of a theme around here. Every, every three or four weeks, I kind of get to that, don't I? Don't listen to gossip about people. And gossip, just quickly, what gossip is, is listening to, so, to information about someone else, whether it's true or not, that you can't do anything about. That's what gossip is. Some people want to gossip and they preface it by saying, but it's true. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. If you're telling me and I can't do anything about it, then I'm listening to gossip. Don't listen to gossip. And then don't listen to filthy talk. Filthy talk will pollute your heart. 
Now, I know some of us work in non-Christian environments. Good for you. Just because there are people. Do you know something I've found about people who aren't Christians? They talk like they're not Christians. And unless you're just going to get completely out of the world and surround yourself with Christians all the time, which the Bible does not promote that we do, because we can't be salt and light if we're just around Christians all the time. So you're going to hear some stuff. You're going to hear some objectionable stuff. You're going to hear some stuff that makes you cringe a little bit. But you need to guard your heart and realize that if you, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between uh, listening to filthy talk because you have to and then listening to filthy talk because you're not guarding your heart. And so you need to pay attention to that. I know uh, I told this story before, but it's been some years ago. I remember when... Uh, uh, years ago, again, when my children were small, and I used to uh, work at a bank, and every once in a while, our district manager would come in, and he would stay for a day or two, a couple days, and he would work in the desk right behind me, and this guy, this guy cussed all the time, all the time. He cussed when he was happy. He cussed when he was sad. He cussed when he was mad. He cussed when he was glad. He cussed all the time. And he was constantly behind, he was behind me and he was on the phone all day or meeting with people all day. And he was in the desk behind me. And I listened to this all day for two solid days. And I mean, it, it wasn't, I'm not just talking about he cussed once an hour. I'm talking about he cussed once a minute. I listened to this for two solid days. We're a Christian family. I'm a, we're leaders in our church. And so we sat down to the, 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 after the second day, he left the office. I went home for dinner. We're sitting down to dinner and... Um, one of the kids accidentally dropped their fork on their plate and it made a really loud clanging noise. Bang! And I looked over and I said, what the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> and everybody just glared at me. Because my kids, because we didn't talk like that. We never said that. You know, I was mortified. Where, where did that come from? <laughs> it came from hearing filthy talk and so here again do not do not go into work tomorrow and turn in your notices god needs you there <laughs> but you need to choose what you listen to when you have the opportunity to do it be salt and light and if you work with somebody that's got a got a really salty language then uh, then just deal with it and plead the blood of jesus and and but watch what you say number one and number two don't ever volu don't ever listen to that kind of talk voluntarily for entertainment wow it's quiet in here <laughs> because filthy talk will pollute your heart uh next guard your heart against cynicism guard your heart against cynicism because cynicism will pollute your heart and cause you to lose heart disappointments are the greatest cause of cynicism disappointments Proverbs 13, 12 says that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. We've all had disappointments. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. We've all had disappointments. We've all had disappointments in relationships. We thought this relationship was going to turn out like this, and it turned out like that. We thought this person was going to be loyal to us, and instead they stabbed us in the back. We know what it's like to have unanswered prayers or prayers that we felt like were unanswered. We really prayed and believed that this would happen, and instead that happened. We all know what, what it's like to have unexplainable events. Things were just going just hunky-dory. Everything was great, and all of a sudden this unexplainable event happened, and we had a hard time dealing with it. And it, this disappointment can cause us to become cynical. Cynical about God. Cynical about faith. Cynical about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Cynical about church and church people. We, it can allow us to become cynical. And cynicism will poison your heart. The remedy for that is Romans 8, 26 through 28. Romans 8. It says, The Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And now we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. 
So it doesn't matter what happens to you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what somebody does to you, who stabs you on the back, what unexplainable events happen, what unanswered prayers happen. None of that matters because we all put our confidence and our faith and our trust, we're all clinging to Jesus Christ. And as we do that, we know that this is all going to work out for our good. I can't tell you the situations that I was so disappointed about and I was so frustrated about. I even became angry about situations. And now, three years later, four years later, five years later, I can look back and I can see God all over it. All things work together. It doesn't mean God causes all things to happen, but it does mean that all of this is going to work out for your good. Amen? Then, fruitful relationships. Being equally, being equally yoked with believers. In marriages, in, uh, in dating, be sure you connect with somebody who's going where you are. Not just somebody that's good looking, somebody that's cute, somebody that's successful. But be sure that you are interested in someone who's going in the same direction that you are. The best place to meet a mate is at church. You met your mate at church, didn't you? I love it. I I love doing weddings of people that met at church, got engaged at church. We married him at church. I love it. The best place to meet your mates at church. Um, Friends, being sure that you have fruitful relationships. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, uh, so a friend sharpens a friend. Proverbs 13, 20 says, become wise by walking with the wise. Oh, Uh, Message Bible says, if you hang out with fools, watch your life fall apart. (laughs) Friends, having godly friends. And this is one of the reasons why we have meetups. You know, meetups start this week. Well, I can tell the whole church is excited. Let me try this again. Meetups start this week. Listen, meetups are great. Be sure you go on the app and find your meetup. Go online and find your meetup. If you're technically challenged, you can go to the, uh, uh, to the information center. What do we call that? The registration desk. What is that called out there? There's a big sign over that says something. I can't hear what? It says yes. What does it say? Information. Does it? I didn't think it said that. It says information. Anyway, out of the hallway, and they've got some hard copies that you can, of the meetups. But Uh, meetups are a great way to meet friends. And I want to talk with you just a moment about having intentional friends. At meetups, everybody at meetups are not going to be perfect. Don't, I want to manage your expectation a little bit about when it comes to meetups, because not everybody at meetups is going to be perfect. In fact, some of the people that you're going to meet at your meetups are going to be just as messed up as you are. The great thing is, we're all headed in the same direction. You're messed up, they're messed up, but we're all recovering together. And that's the great thing about meetups. It's a place where you can develop intentional friendships. You see, so many of our friendships, I want you to think about this. So many of our friendships are unintentional. We never actually intentionally created those friendships. Neighbors. You didn't pick who moved in next door to you, they just moved in. And walked over and introduced themselves. I'm not saying that they're bad people or they're good people. I'm saying these are unintentional friends. Some of us have good neighbors. I have good neighbors. I love my, I've got great neighbors. Some of you have good neighbors. Some of you have neighbors that aren't so good. Some of you that have neighbors that are just so-so. But but the thing is, they were not intentional. You didn't pick them. They just moved in next door one day. And the relationship was created. The same way with coworkers. You didn't, when you signed up, when you, when you got hired for the job, you didn't say, now before I get hired, I want to go meet everybody that's going to work anywhere around me. And I want to know who they are and see if they can be my friends. <laughs> you went to work and there they were. And these are, some of them are your friends, but they are unintentional friends. Even in your family. We didn't even pick our family. God, what were, what were you thinking? But we didn't pick any of these people. And so meetups are an opportunity for us to intentionally pick friends. We can actually go to a meetup and say, here, these are my people. They're as messed up as I am. It's going to be great. But these are my people. This is my meetup. People have, some people have many friends. People can have many friends. 
But usually few, if any of those, are deliberate. So go to the app, sign up for meetups. We want, we want everybody to sign up for a meetup. There are all kinds of meetups. Some meet twice a month. Some meet, will meet every week. Some meet once a month. There's a meetup for everybody. And I forget how many there are. I think there are probably 30 different meetups on, on the site. So go on there. You can go on the app and, uh, uh, and sign up for a meetup. This week is when they start. And lastly, let me just talk about making the house of God a priority. We talked about hearing the right things, guarding your heart against disappointment, cultivating fruitful relationships. Church is the place where you can do all that. Church is the place where you can hear the right things. Amen. Thank you, Jenny. Church is the place where you can hear the right things. Amen. Church is the place where you can pray in the Holy Spirit and guard your heart against disappointment. Church is a place where you can cultivate fruitful relationships. Guarding your heart is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about guarding your heart, what God has placed in there. Church is such an important part of that. Listen to this. Corporate worship strengthens your heart for the battles of life. Hearing the word produces faith for the battles of life. Giving even provides resources for the battles of life. And then prayer is the battlefield. Ephesians 6, 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Holy Spirit. Church life, if you want to protect your, that is usually the place where the enemy attacks you first, is your church life. Just, you don't need them, they don't need you. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Watch out, be careful what you listen to. Guard your attitude. Be careful that you don't get cynical. Let's guard the life that God's placed in our heart. Would you stand with me, please? Anybody get out of this, anything out of this message today? I want you to say this after me. God's will for my life is abundance and to experience abundant Zoe, life. life. The thief came to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus Christ came. And the Holy Spirit lives in my life. So that I might have Zoe life. And that I have it abundantly. I trust God. I cling to God. I rely on my relationship with Jesus. And because of these things, Zoe life lives in my heart. I protect this Zoe life. I guard my heart by watching what I hear. By guarding my heart against cynicism. And intentionally fostering fruitful relationships. I make the house of God a priority in my life. In my family's life, I guard the Zoe life in my heart, and I experience abundant life in every area, in my health, in my finances, in my family, in my marriage, in my children. I am a walking billboard of the goodness of God, of the life of God. Thank you, Father. That I am blessed, I walk in favor, and I protect the life of God on the inside of me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. No empty lives, folks. No empty lives. Lead an abundant life. Lead an abundant life. Protect that life on the inside of you. I want to give you an opportunity today to make a decision to follow Christ. I want you to pray a prayer after me in just a moment. Saying yes to God saying, yes, I want that abundant life on the inside of me as well. Maybe you've never prayed a prayer like this before. Maybe you've never even been to church before. Or maybe you used to serve God and you've fallen away from the Lord. You're not where you need to be with God and you know you, you're not. And as I'm talking about the life of God, you're thinking, I need to get back to that relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to pray a prayer with you right there where you are. I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Everybody who wants to pray this prayer with me and wants to make a decision to follow Christ, wants that Zoe life on the inside of you, I want you to raise your hand 
real high, right there where you're standing, and say, I want to pray this prayer. I want God's life on the inside of me. Let's all pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Zoe life of God that lives on the inside of believers. I receive your free gift of salvation today. I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Your blood washing away all my sins. And I receive that today in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come into my life right now. Bringing the Zoe life of God into my heart. I commit myself to live for you. In Jesus' name.